Okay, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Education, Children and Young People's Committee in 2024. We have apologies from Stephanie Callaghan, so welcome back Jackie Dunbar. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is an evidence session on the Schools Residential Outdoor Education Scotland Bill at Stage 1. This is a Members Bill which has been brought forward by Liz Smith, MSP, who is in the public gallery with us today. Uh, can I begin by welcoming our witnesses? Uh, Emeritus Professor Chris Loins, Professor of Human Nature Relations, Institute of Science and Environment Centre for National Parks and Protected Areas and Outdoor Studies, University of Cumbria. Professor Greg Mannion, Senior Lecturer in Education at the University of Stirling, who is joining us remotely today, and Dr Roger Scrutton, Honorary Research Fellow in Outdoor Education at the University of Edinburgh. Can I welcome you all uh, to the committee today? We've got a lot we want to question you on. Uh, and Professor Mannion, if you can just indicate by raising your hand, if you want to come in, I'll try and catch uh, that on my eye uh, on the screen as well. Uh, can I just begin uh, with, with a general opening question? And I should say we, we've got a lot to go through. So if you hear uh, evidence is the same as your, your own, you can just say that you agree with that uh, and move on. But just generally, perhaps, uh, Professor Loins, I was reading your uh, written submission to the committee, particularly about your own research, looking at the significant improvements in, in maths and literacy scores uh, and exams for pupils uh, who have been on outdoor residential uh, courses and such like. Could you outline each of you why you think outdoor education is an important element uh, and why you think this bill uh, should be supported. I think you've all agreed that, that there is a need for this, some with caveats and conditions, but uh, the general principle of this, what's, what's your views on the bill and the need for outdoor residential education? I'm in support of the bill very much, if, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm start, colleagues. Um, I'm in support of the bill. Uh, I'm in support of uh, residential experiences for young people as part of their uh, formal education. Uh, and that's based on the evidence from the Learning Away project that I was involved in. Uh, I, I think to give a little bit of flesh on the bones to the idea that um, outdoor education and residentials in particular have an impact on en engagement and attainment, what, cha what they change is the relationships between students and between students and their teachers. Uh, they change their confidence and their agency in willing to engage with each other. It changes the relationships then back in the classroom and the transfer from uh, a class that's been on a residential together uh, back into the classroom and the difference in the classroom in their social relations at, between themselves and with the teacher. In addition, they learn new ways of teaching and learning and those come into the classroom too. Um, I can give you one example of a, a low attaining literacy group who were sitting in the classroom around their table with the same literacy score organised by her teacher. Uh, and they decided to set, as a result of the residential, they learned uh, how to work together, how to collaborate, how to take initiative. And they decided to set themselves writing and spelling challenges. And they up their literacy scores in a, in a month from being low attaining to being middle of the upper attaining group. And that without any of the teacher's knowledge, she didn't know how they actually managed to uh, progress their scores until we uh, told her from our research evidence about what they'd been up to. So uh, it also, I think it is an important element, when teachers go on residentials with the young people, uh, we, we called it the I saw miss and pyjamas effect. It sort of humanises the teacher. Um, and um, the impact on the teacher, the personal social development benefits to teacher and teachers, the, the teaching group, is as good as the impact on the young people. It in, impacts on their self-esteem uh, uh, and their um, ability to take agency and uh, to, to try out new things in the classroom. The result is shifts in attainment because of better attention, better engagement. Dr Scutton? Yeah, well, I would um, echo all of those things, convener. Um, I mean, Chris mentioned some evidence um, at the beginning of his little talk there. And what I would say is, because I'm in touch with the research fraternity around the world, essentially, um, that there are many examples of that sort of evidence um, where... Um, you can link the activity or at least the, the um, attendance at an outdoor residential experience with improved academic performance. 
Um, I'm thinking particularly of um, another one in the UK called the London Challenge, which became the City Challenge. It was a bit like learning away in the sense that it was a huge project, thousands of pupils um, funded, well, learning away was funded by a charity. I can't remember who funded the City Challenge, but it went on for several years, run by City, uh, University of London education people. And uh, that came up with very similar results. Um, that uh, the children going away on the residential programme um, improved both academically but also personally and interpersonally with their colleagues and, and with the staff in, in the school. So I think um, what Chris says it is, is absolutely right. Um, there are one or two things I would add, um, which are really points of detail, I suppose, that uh, there are specific areas, I think, of, of child development and in, in their personal and social development and in their education um, where you can see um, strong benefit um, through, uh, well, I happen to do quantitative research with statistics and so on, but you see it in the qualitative research as well. And it's areas like gender, okay? Um, there's a clear signal from essentially the global um, research base that young ladies uh, get more out of the experience than, than the boys do. And um, I mean, the, you know, there's all sorts of interpretations of that that uh, sort of build on what you might think of as stereotypical reactions to going away on a residential um, uh, in terms of the gender differences. Um, but the sorts of areas where um, the females do particularly well are in things like um, resilience, self-confidence. Uh, I smile sometimes when I also see social efficacy because the young ladies tend to be very good at social efficacy from the start. But, um, I mean, typically the, the males um, attend in an overconfident way and the girls in a less confident way. Um, you know, this is all rather stereotypical stuff, I'm afraid. Um, but when you measure at the end or you talk, uh, talk it through with the pupils and the teachers at the end, um, you find it's pretty much round the other way. The, the, the males may not have improved at all sometimes in terms of the measures that we make, um, but always the females improve. Um, and so I think that, that's another thing. I mean, there are some other details, uh, for example, um, particularly in the United States, but it's been done in Scotland as well, um, these outdoor residential interventions have been used for therapeutic purposes. And um, it just crossed my mind when I was thinking about this meeting today um, that, uh, you know, I'm not talking about um, their effect therapeutically on the mental health um, in terms of curing somebody, let's say, but I'm really thinking of the rise in neurodiversity and trauma amongst young people, which, you know, if, if I'm, I believe what I'm told by head teachers and so on is really quite dire now. Um, and I do think that the one week experience, and I do support the one week, um, I mean, you can do outdoor learning at one or two days, you know, you can get something very good out of that sort of thing, either locally or in the um, just over a weekend or something, but the week has a unique impact on the well-being of young people. Um, so I'd see this not only from the attainment, the achievement, the attainment angle, and there are a number of very good examples of where that's been proved, um, but also from you know a number of different personal and social aspects, um, particularly around gender, particularly about health and well-being. Um, I've done some research myself that shows that children from deprived communities tend to do better than children. Um, in fact, I think it's still the only research in Scotland, actually, um, that is uh, still referenced um, as evidence of children from deprived neighbourhoods uh, getting more out of the visit, residential visit than, than the other children do. Point there uh, about the, the length. You, you say in your written evidence that a long weekend, Friday to Monday, might be enough to establish uh, effective learning elements, but it's a longer period, five days, four nights, that can really have the biggest impact and, and the greatest change. Y yes, absolutely. Because um, the other thing I've done research on, and several other people actually, I'm certainly not, not the only one, um, is on the process of learning. 
during the experience. Um, and it's pretty clear now that the academic outcomes, the cognitive learning, um, comes about because of this improved interaction between pupils and staff and between themselves. Um, the, what we call the effective dimensions of development, um, those seem to underpin the cognitive development. And that takes about a week. Um, well, yeah, I mean, a week happens to be a useful length of time from the point of view of school management and so on and so forth anyway. But um, a week seems to bring that out, whereas I'm not entirely sure one or two days would actually be able to complete that particular process. Okay, thank you. And Professor Mannion. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me, I take it. Yeah, um, perfect. Yes, thank you for the invitation today and thanks, convener, for, for this opportunity. Um, it, it's, it's certainly the case that uh, residential provision is a really significant and uh, a hugely important part of outdoor uh, learning provision in Scotland. Um, and there are some really excellent centres doing really brilliant work. And the majority of the experiences I, I, would, I would expect are providing young learners with the outcomes that we've heard about today in the main. Um, we should be aware that the research in this area has to take account of the fact that it can only do the research on the provision that we've already got. And if we go back in time, the history of outdoor education as a term, which is different from our Scottish policy term, outdoor learning, which, which we've had since 2010, um, has focused on uh, self-confidence, leadership, self-efficacy, resilience, and these other uh, factors. So that has been the focus of the research. So two things there. Uh, if outdoor provision had uh, been looking at other things, we would be able to account for those other outcomes. For example, we do have small, smaller amounts of research on this area, but if, if you put in, in terms of input, into a residential experience, a concern for the environment, then you're very likely to get that as an outcome. Uh, so pro-environmental behaviour will arise through experience and nature over time. Um, if you go on a conservation action week uh, and you're doing action for the environment, you're very likely to, to have those kinds of outcomes uh, in, in the research too. If you were to go on a residential visit uh, on the drove roads of Scotland, taking a heritage approach, and it was community-led, and you uh, were to understand through the use of Gaelic what the, the, that experience was about, you would have different kinds of outcomes there, which would be connected to identity, place-based attachment, and we have these evidences in the research too available to us. So my point is, uh, the tradition of outdoor education research, which the previous two uh, um, speakers, uh, I, 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 they're very erudite in what they're providing, this evidence is absolutely rock solid. Uh, these are the kinds of outcomes we can be assured of. Uh, what I'm also pointing to is other kinds of research and other types of outdoor provision provides us with other kinds of outcomes. The bill takes the view that outdoor education is the term we should use, uh, but we know that outdoor learning is the policy term and the vast majority of the time spent outdoors is led by teachers in local places, um, mostly in school grounds. Um, and we know that that level of provision could be doubled or trebled with some support for teachers. So in that context, we uh, wanted in our, in our letter to um, your committee to make the point that uh, a wider perspective uh, should at least be acknowledged in this. And we don't want to do away with residential centres. That's not the point I'm making. Uh, but I want to make the point that uh, overall, the residential centre provision, if that's what the bill wants to support, and these are the outcomes you want to support, uh, is available to us in policy terms. And I'm not a policymaker, I'm here to provide evidence. However, in the current context, young people through Children's Parliament in Scotland were asked what they wanted. They said they wanted more time outside in nature and they wanted to address learning for sustainability. Neither of the previous two speakers spoke about learning for sustainability because the research tradition in outdoor education hasn't looked at that. But going outdoors in nature in the current context of the nature emergency at a time of, of a climate crisis seems to me to be a strange thing to do if we don't acknowledge the policy context of outdoor learning, its place within learning for sustainability, and our concern for environmental outcomes. So these relationships that are being built between pupils and teachers 
and between pupils and pupils needs to be set inside another context, which is our human relationship with nature at this point in time. And I didn't see that come through in the bill. And uh, I think what we need to consider is what we want to achieve through what will be an expensive uh, provision, I expect, if government is to warrant that every pupil gets one of these experiences. Um, the other thing I, I think I've said in my submission is, of course, that uh, the tradition has been that outdoor education, rather than outdoor learning, has been residential based. But we also know from really expert schools and expert teachers that outdoor learning provision, day long and residential, teacher led, one day, two day and three day, from the ages of five and six in some schools, has over the, the career of the child, uh, got the benefit of being linked to the curriculum better because the teachers are engaged with it more. And this, if you think about a 25 night stay, which I know one primary school in Scotland provides a 25 night provision over the career of the child. So then everything that the previous two speakers say uh, is there as a, a warrant for what they're likely to get because they're not getting one week, they're getting five weeks uh, over that period of time. It's an exceptional school. Uh, it is privately funded, but it exemplifies the kinds of thing I think that we're coming through in the intention of the bill, which was to provide for state provided schools uh, some of this kind of experience. Um, um, so, I sorry, we, stop there. I yeah, I've no, thank you. Hey, Dr. Scrutton, you wanted to come back in. Yeah, um, I mean, Greg's, Greg's right. There's been very little research on um, the impact on the learning for sustainability aspects of the curriculum that um, are now being introduced. Um, but that's in Scotland. <laughs> if you look worldwide, um, there's been an enormous amount of research on connection with nature. Um, sorry, I hit my microphone. Is it OK? Yeah. Just on, on that point, I notice uh, Professor Mannion's uh, nodding in agreement there, so I think it's worth just getting that on, on the record as well. Yeah, yeah. Is it OK to move on to some of the other questions? Because we've already used a, a chunk of time with those introductions, and if there's anything that we, we haven't covered there, you can come back in at the end, Professor Lawrence, if that's key. Uh, we'll move now to Bill Kidd. Uh, yep. And uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I have a, a wee interesting tale, which might be interesting, it might not. Um, when I was 10, um, which was about oh, 12 years ago, thank you, yes. Uh, when I was 10, um, I went to a school in Partick, and uh, there were three primary schools, including mine, who were um, taken away um, by the local authority for five straight weeks to a place called Galloway House, which is down, obviously, in Galloway. And um, the teachers, our teachers came with us as well. Um, we didn't have separate staff in the area or anything like that sort of thing. And we stayed over and we get taken out um, into the country, which most of us had never really been to very much at all, into the seaside and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but we also got our straight school classes as well you know we did still actually had their ed normal education as well um added on so i don't know if that's anything like what you're talking about here i know that you're talking about shorter term than, than five straight weeks um but um that was something which i am aware that people who were there really did feel that they were they benefited from doing um because it wasn't as if every year another class would be taken this was a seemed to be a one-off thing as far as i knew anyway and uh, our parents actually had to pay two pounds 12 and sixpence for the five weeks um which doesn't seem like very much money but uh, we stayed in a big um a sort of huge place called galloway house as i say um now but we did uh, benefit from getting our education continuing um, as as you normally get as a primary school pupil, but we also had these other um, experiences which we never would have had any, in any other way. Um, so I don't know if that type of thing is similar to what you're talking about. If that makes, if it's if the description is of any use at all, um, but I, I think it benefited everybody who went, actually boys and girls. Um, so, but. What I was going to really ask around about that is, um, are there different or differing roles 
of school staff and outdoor education centre staff? Do they cooperate and, and work together? Model that the, the, the projects that I was involved in, that you got much better outcomes than when that, when that was the case. In, in fact, one of the criteria we identified that made one of the bigger differences was when children and, and school staff were involved in designing the residential. Um, one of the uh, primary school groups, a cluster of eight primary schools, uh, who went away together in, in uh, our year six in England um, as a transition res residential just before going to the secondary school. Uh, asked the children what was the what they thought the challenges were of going to secondary and how they thought a residential might help them overcome those challenges and what activities should be on the residential. The answer to that question surprised us all. It was telling scary stories in the tent at night and still being able to go to sleep. Uh, and, and that you can translate into the resilience necessary uh, for going to the big school. And the people who told the scary stories to the children were year eights from the big school. So you have that relationship building going on in the residential before the transition takes place. We've also uh, had a look at when you embed curriculum content in the outdoor experience, as you're describing, uh, whether you teach it in separate sort of blocks of time during the day, or whether you embed it into the outdoor experiences, you, in either uh, method, you get uh, the same uplift in engagement and attainment, because it seems to be the process that's most important for, uh, rather than the particular way you deliver the curriculum content. Okay. Thank you. Professor Mannion, sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Chris. Your, your research in this area is really great. And having teachers on board is a really critical part of this whole uh, business of going outside. Whether that's a, a lesson or whether it's a week long, having the teacher doing things perhaps in class ahead of time and doing things back in class after they return is known to be one of the key things that makes outdoor learning work well. Um, if, uh, if the focus is on transition and you have a transition oriented uh, residential, you'll get outcomes connected tra to transition. So again, it's to do with input shaping and output expected. You're more likely with longer durations to get better outcomes. Uh, so absolutely, those, those two things are, are true. Okay, but, sorry, Dr. Scratton. One area of research that has been really quite popular uh, for many years now is um, uh, the long-term impact on an individual. Um, you know, you, you still remember your in, uh, residential now, um, 10 years later, you said? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it'd be quite interesting to know how many folks have been on residentials and remember them. Um, but, you know, these are very, these are unique um, in terms of the experience and the outcomes. And, um, they are memorable. Um, in fact, we distinguish between outcomes and impact. Outcomes is what you get immediately afterwards. Um, and impact is what happens, you know, weeks, months, and so on later. Um, and uh, I mean, I've been involved in a couple of uh, projects that um, look back now with people at uh, their experiences. Um, and they are universally positive. Quite often, they've affected the individual's uh, career path. Um, it's cemented their love of the outdoors. Um, it has helped them to Im improve their career success, all those sorts of things. Um, so it's not just a short-term thing. I mean, I agree totally about this embedding in the curriculum. That's absolutely essential, that children are prepared and there's follow-up in the classroom. And by the way, on the five-week thing, um, there is also some research to show that benefit grows for uh, interventions up to about three weeks long, and then it plateaus out. And there's not much more benefit for going five weeks, for instance. Um, that's, again, it's not in Scotland. That's in the United States mainly and other parts of the world. Um, our, our research is rather poor in Scotland, quite frankly, into this. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I think... Um, there's a, there's a long-term impact um, that goes on for many decades afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is it brief, Professor Mannion? Yeah. Very brief. Uh, just to say in our own surveys about our provision, when we asked hundreds of teachers in 20, 2008, 2000, 
2014 and 2022, we asked teachers about their sense of whether the outdoor event, whether that was 20 minutes, an hour, or a residential trip, whether they felt the indoor lesson on a similar topic would have been or has ever been as effective or as engaging. We use the word engagement. Uh, the teachers in, in the 70s and 80s of percentages were all saying that the outdoor provision was more uh, engaging for, for learners. I would trust teachers on this one. They know when their learners are engaged. It's a, it's a construct in our field, but uh, teachers' understanding of engagement is quite a, a nuanced one. So whether we go residentially or not, we need to understand that the broad breadth of provision outdoors is very engaging. And, that can, and we know from Nature Connection that 10 minutes outdoors where people are attending to nature in a focused way has also got the impact of connection to nature. So regardless of how long the, the journeys are uh, or how long the residential experiences are, there are benefits. Obviously, the longer the term, the more likely there will be benefits. And Roger is the man to document that for us. And I'm really fascinated about that three week plateau. That's a really good, a good point to make, Roger. I've not, not really got my teeth into that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn Tweed. Thanks, Convener, and good morning, panel. Like Bill, I also remember my residential. It wasn't quite as long ago as Bill's, I don't think. Um, and also, my, my own children have had residentials, and they had ben benefited from them greatly. But my question is around how many pupils in Scotland actually get to experience a residential of this nature? At the moment, you mean what is the uptake by schools yeah. on? It's <laughs> a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I think Mike, is Mike, Mike Harvey there has been doing some research on numbers. He may know um, what the uptake is at, at the present day. I mean, I understand from the research that's been done that Mike's done and others have done that there is just enough bed capacity in residential centres as they exist at the moment to accommodate this, pro this project if as, you know, this project goes through and every child has the opportunity and goes away on a residential at some point between S6 and, sorry, P6 and S4. Um, but uh, that would be, um, I mean, they'd, they'd be absolutely packed in. There wouldn't be any chance for maintenance and all that sort of thing. So um, I think at the moment, the uptake uh, residential centres can cope with and they, even some of them have been, have been closing because they've not got the business and they haven't got the money to make the, and the maintenance supports and so on. On the other hand, Aberdeenshire has just opened a new residential centre, um, 40 places I think, um, and has immediately got it filled for about a year. Lagalier and Benmore, and the two um, remote outdoor centres, City of Edinburgh, they're booked for three years in advance. I mean, there's a huge demand, but I'm afraid I can't actually give a number um, as to, you know, is it 50 per cent, 40 per cent? I, I just don't know. That's fine. And do you feel that there are socioeconomic or geographical factors which affect participation in terms of which yeah. pupils can actually I, yeah. I can have answer the that experience? For, I can answer that for England. Uh, um, which is that uh, recent work done by the Council for Learning Outside the Classroom demonstrated that uh, during the career of a child through primary and secondary, they would, on average, have two residential experiences. But that uh, distribution of that geographically is very unequal. And peop uh, young people from urban areas and from low socioeconomic backgrounds receive none or very few compared with those in other contexts. So it's, it's very unevenly distributed. Uh, name, Professor Mannion. OK. Uh, ha having said that, um, there is research evidence um, that uh, young people from more deprived backgrounds gain more. It's a bit like females gaining more than males. But um, there's a paper... I published it in 2012. It's still the only paper referenced um, regarding this in Scotland, um, where I managed to work with uh, City of Edinburgh primary schools going to Benmore and Lag and Lear, and then divided them up on, uh, on free school meals, as it was. Um, this index of deprivation now. Um, and uh, it's a very clear signal. Not only did the 
kids from the deprived areas benefit more, they retain the benefit more after about six months. Um, so I think um, you know, that's another part of the demographic that stands to benefit probably slightly more than average. Um, from. Yeah. Professor Mannion, you wanted to come in there. Yes, briefly. Um, uh, the, the work in England is replicated in, in terms of the general thrust. Uh, in Scotland, young people from uh, postcodes that are more deprived than others in the Scottish Multiple Index of, of Deprivation, they, uh, they receive less outdoor learning overall, and that includes teacher-led outdoor learning in school grounds and beyond in local areas, day long as day long trips to national parks and so on. These things have costs. In these areas, the schools are struggling and they need support. And I'm here not to advise policymakers, but if, you're, if your concern is, are, are young people in areas of deprivation not getting residential trips? And is that more likely than others? Yes. And should you be targeting them? That's your policy choice. Similarly, teachers are not providing as much outdoor provision as they could across the piece. And if you were to fund teacher professional learning, you would vastly increase the amount of du the duration of time outdoors that young people are getting. In 2014, in primary schools, on average, in the eight week period in May and June uh, in 2014, which we won't talk about 2022 because it was still infected by COVID, but young people were getting a about a half an hour outdoors per pupil per week. That's a half an hour in the week on top of separate from physical education. Of that 30 minutes, six minutes was residential time. So one fifth of the outdoor provision time was residential and the other four fifths was non-residential. And that was a, an average. Some schools were hardly going out at all and some schools were going out enormously more commonly than that because they had teachers that knew what they were doing. So in policy terms, if you want to pr promote outdoor learning in terms of duration with all the benefits we've heard about, then you should certainly support residential centres, but you should also consider uh, from our research in 2022, which is uh, summarised in the review, uh, professional learning. Nearly half of teachers, I think it's 60% of teachers are feeling vaguely confident about outdoor learning and learning for sustainability. That, that figure is not, that's an average. I'm just giving you a broad brush. Uh, we've got large numbers of staff who simply need support to do to address learning for sustainability, which is in their curriculum. That's their obligation. And they need to do that with, with, with professional learning. We know that teachers who had professional learning do more outdoor provision. That connection is clear. Okay, thank you. We'll move to Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning to the panel and thank you for the information that you sent us ahead of today. Um, to pick up on the conversation we're, we're, we're having, um, I, I too, I guess, in the spirit of um, what we've been sharing, can remember my, my school residential. Um, as, a, as a disabled person, it was quite different. And in the year that our, um, my year uh, were, were going on the residential, they had to create a, a kind of very different one so that um, there was an option. So you got to choose whether you would go to an outdoor centre, you got to choose which particular activity you would want to get involved in, none of which were really suitable for um, m myself uh, and as a wheelchair user. So they created a separate residential um, choice and all pupils from the mainstream school were able to choose that as well. And so there was, um, it was focused on drama and, and included an element of outdoor learning. So my question, I guess, is, how, how well do we think residential learning, including outdoor learning, meets the needs of all pupils, including those with additional support needs? And, and I've heard that you've said, all of you have said, the benefits are um, at most um, keenly felt by socioeconomic groups that are, are, are more deprived than others, and that, that's, that's really useful. So how well do you think re residential outdoor education could meet the needs of all pupils? Certainly, uh, certainly, we know how to provide residential experiences for people with uh, who are um, different disabilities and mental challenges, um, including multiple disabilities. Um, there are some good examples, case studies here in Scotland. There's a, 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 a centre that specialises in adapted outdoor provision uh, just outside Edinburgh. Uh, that the school I was studying, Calder Glen, from East Kilbride which is partnered with uh, a, a special needs school, an SEN school, um, uh, was making very good use of. 
they were absolutely um, convinced of the benefit of taking their young people to these residentials and, and also of the integration uh, of those residentials with those from the, the main school, which, which is how they operated. These centres do exist throughout, throughout the UK, specialist centres that are able to, to use different tra differently trained staff, different types of equipment, offer appropriate levels of, of adventure experiences and environmental experiences. So it's building on that uh, um, capacity in order that all young people from uh, with those kinds of circumstances uh, can benefit and seeking ways to do that in a, in a form that's integrated. Thank you. Did... I, mean, I, I don't see any reason at all um, why there shouldn't be a very similar experience, actually. I think the, the, the offering at residential centres now is slightly changing. Um, I mean, there are, as Chris says, I mean, I'm thinking of the Brathay Trust, you know, that works in the Lake District, and um, Loch Winnock in, in Scotland, which has, um, I mean, both of those specialise in using sail training um, for folks with disabilities. Um, and those young people can get onto the boats and function really just like anybody else on the boat, to be honest. Um, but the offering within outdoor residentials is changing slightly. I mean, it used to be this um, very uh, uh, character building approach. You know, you've got to hang off ropes, be scared stiff, um, you know, face drain, drown, drain, uh, drowning in the lock, that sort of thing, run a mile before breakfast and so on. You, that used to be the emphasis. But now it's very much more about a wider range of skills. And some of them will now probably be essentially academic work, might be um, a little bit conservation work or project work of some sort or another at the res outdoor residential centre. So I think there are lots of opportunities, actually, that we could work on to um, provide experiences that are available to everyone. Thank you. Um, and do, do either of our panel think there's anything within the bill that needs to, to change in order to address some of the, the concerns that we've heard um, through, through evidence, including from CPAG um, and NASUWT, who've raised some concerns about the kind of starting point of pupils and the starting point of schools. So having those residential centres is, is crucial. I've, I've been to some of them as well, and they are, they're, they're, they're really good. But getting that getting the young person with um, additional support needs um, over the line to go in the first place and the school having the confidence that they've got the support there to support them to do it. Is there anything in it that we would need to change in, in, in the bill as it currently stands to try and support that to happen? Um, can I just mention an experience I had with one school, actually, um, was that uh, the teacher... Um, this is a very specific class. The teacher um, did not incorporate the outdoor experience into the curriculum in any way, uh, by way of um, follow-up rather than, than preparation, but particularly around follow-up. And I asked her why she didn't do that, and she said, ah, oh, it's because I had a, a child, disabled child in the class, and that child couldn't go away um, for various practical reasons, couldn't go away to the outdoor centre, and she didn't like to do follow-up work if, unless the whole class had had the experience. So I think, um, you know, we do need to find ways of how to in incorporate um, everybody into the experience. I mean, some, some uh, you know, travelling to and from and residential centre, that should, we should be able to overcome that. I mean, it's possible that uh, personal assistance, for example, could be provided um, either by someone the child knows or maybe a specialist in that in, in the outdoor centre. But I think there are ways around it, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Come in. Thank you. Um, I think the watchword here has to be flexibility. And um, I have a feeling in the bill, uh, a couple of things where I've flagged up this potential for a lack of flexibility is that we uh, take too, too restricting a concern for what age young people might want to go on a residential and 
with the caveats around duration uh, and with my own view, of course, that the longer people spend outdoors, the better, uh, we maybe don't need to uh, be fixated on the idea that it needs to be a week. We maybe don't need to be as uh, presumptive of the fact that it's an outdoor education residential centre that the young people go to. Uh, we maybe want to be thinking about earlier um, provision in the years of primary, building towards residential provision for some of these young people, because that will build their expectations rather than having this one-off, one-week thing, if that's the only thing that the government is helping schools to fund. But if we have teachers that are well-trained and are able to bring young, young people towards all kinds of outdoor experiences, and remember, uh, there shouldn't be in the bill anything to stop, I think, a school wanting to go away on a residential day or one night or two nights where they want to address history or drama or music or p as you've described uh, these this flexibility around curriculum uh, making and the interdisciplinary nature of learning for sustainability should be built into the into the the, the bill so that the teachers uh, can be the driving force around the decision making meeting the needs of every young person and not ending up with the situation that roger described I could, could I just quickly take in George then? He wants to ask a supplementary on this. Quick stop in the back of uh, what Pam was saying. Uh, trying to, you always, and this inevitably we all, we've been talking about personal experience, but I'm taking it to the next level because I've got a granddaughter who's neurodivergent. Uh, she's nine year old. She struggles at school. So you end up with a whole stack of young children, which you've already mentioned uh, that uh, are neurodivergent. Now, we have difficulties as a family making sure she's even wearing clothes when she goes out because she doesn't like the feel of them and all that. And she can make family get-togethers and family uh, excursions quite difficult. How do you do in a residential setting? How do you deal with that when you've maybe got four or five children that are like that as well? How do you deal with that challenge so they get that opportunity? Because if anyone needs that opportunity, I would say this group of young children, uh, young people do as well. So how, 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 how do you deal with that? Well, I can respond to that. Um, I'd, I'd like to say, in general, pe uh, students with neurodiverse backgrounds uh, uh, actually flourish in, in the outdoors more so than they do in classrooms. They actually learn. It's a much more um, a supportive learning environment for them mm -hmm. uh, and often surprise their teachers and their peers uh, in the way that they engage. Um, in my professional practice, when I was a centre manager at, at the, at the Braithley Trust that Roger mentioned, uh, we worked with uh, daycare centres who were dealing, uh, working with providing uh, respite care for, for people with, uh, who were caring for young people with diverse, uh, multiple uh, disabilities uh, and, and giving them respite. And they would be coming on a residential for two nights in, in, in their cases over a weekend. Uh, and we were able to, to deal with every um, uh, situation that we were presented with, and the uh, respite care centre didn't leave anybody behind. They, they carefully selected groups that they thought would, we would be able to offer something uh, to, that they could do together. There were different needs and for different age groups, for example, and different challenges. Um, one of my most profound um, professional experiences was uh, floating down a, a river with, with a, a, a young girl, a 13-year-old girl, who had no movement, no speech, and nobody knew she had any cognition. Oh, she had cognition. The look in her eyes when she saw what she was about to do told me everything I needed to know about whether we did or we didn't do this activity. And so it's about having the experiences for uh, the staff having the support in our case of the respite care uh, team and their, their nurses and so on with us so that we could care for the, the needs of those young people minute by minute as well as provide them with those uh, appropriate um, ex outdoor experiences. Okay, uh, okay. Dr. Scott, and then we'll come back. I can um, just give another experience. I, I run a charity called the Friends of Benmore Centre. It supports the work of Benmore Outdoor Centre over in Argyll. And every year um, it uh, hosts the sort of course that Chris has just been talking about for young people in the Danoon neighbourhood, um, maybe five or ten actually. Um, there's an organisation called CLASP. I'm not sure if you've come across CLASP. It specialises in supporting young people need, needing, needing special attention and so on. But they come as a group um, rather than in, you know, from their schools individual schools they'll come as a group 
and there's a necessary support facilities provided at Benmore for that and adjust adjustments of the activities. Thank you. Pam. Um, can, I, can I just follow up, if I may, with Professor Mannion? Um, on the, the point that you've just made, and my colleague George Adams said we, that we're sharing some personal experience, and, um, and we are, and I think that's really important. And I wondered, though, in your submission, you said um, you, you kind of lift this to the systemic point, and you say that systemic for support for schools, staff, communities and partner organisations that provide for outdoor learning would be needed. So in the context of this particular part of the discussion, could you tell us a bit about what that support might look like? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And I would want to spend longer than I have today to explain. But uh, predominantly, our biggest concern, the biggest missing piece in this jigsaw is teacher professional learning. So when teachers get an opportunity to learn more about provision, they're better placed to engage with outdoor learning on, every, on an everyday basis. Local, local nature, and in a way that's connected to the curriculum becomes more assured. Teachers and pupils' relationships improve. And, and so on. But the amount of professional learning we know that teachers need in this isn't an afternoon. Uh, it is approximately six to ten half-day sessions. We know this because once you get to those that, that number of about ten half-day sessions or a, a five-day learning, which might be spread over a nine-month period, uh, teaching in nature was our model and, and we, we know that that worked. Uh, teachers then uh, are ready to engage in outdoor. If they're engaging in outdoor learning through the curriculum on an everyday basis, they're also better placed to work with partners in a teacher connected way, in a curriculum linked way with their residential experience. So it, it, at a system level, if you want to engage in that way, uh, you're also more assured uh, in terms of inclusion of, of getting every member of your, your class group on board and discerning whether an outdoor one night camping event in the local park for nine year olds is what is, is needed uh, on a given weekend. Uh, the teacher is going to be best placed to make that decision. Have they got the access to the, the correct partners, Nature Scott, the, 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 the other ranger services and other professionals that are on hand to help? Uh, they will know who they are if, if we're funding across the piece and encouraging networking across those providers. Uh, so the policy question you've got today is whether you want to honeypot the money in the residential context and move in that direction, which I, I, we all validly uh, support because we know that will work too. Uh, but as a, at a system level, it, it's a different question. And that was my critique of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Dunbar. Uh, good, good morning, panel. Following on from um, the, the questions that, the, that Pam was saying, I was just going to ask if there are any other uh, barriers preventing our young folk from um, experiencing the outdoor residential experience. Uh, I'm not sure who would like to go first. Yeah. Well, at the moment, of course, it's cost. <laughs> Very definitely. Um, I mean, actually, it's really impressive uh, how successful some of the parent, uh, fundraising activities among, amongst parents at certain schools um, will help with the cost um, that allows the children to go. But I wouldn't mind betting there are some examples of schools that just don't take their children on... Um, the residential experience because of the cost. Um, probably also, uh, as we've just been talking about, um, uh, and that is the, the teacher um, experience as well, the, the relative experiences and, and um, abilities of the teacher to organise that. Um, actually, in that context, what I'm thinking of now is um, uh, the ability to... Uh, manage staff within the school so that uh, a teacher who does have some outdoor learning experience can go away um, but her absence which might involve more than one class let's say particularly at secondary level and um, perhaps not so much at, um, this wouldn't work it wouldn't be a, a problem at primary level but it might be at secondary level let's say it's a maths teacher then someone's got to stand in for maths for the other classes in the school so there are practicalities that, got, um, that you have to get round to do that. Correct. I think uh, most of the teachers that, that go away, it's on a voluntary basis, if I'm, if I'm correct in thinking. So, so uh, at present, I mean, so do you think that the local authorities should have a duty to provide the education? 
that the outdoor education, so that it's not maybe not just fully voluntary. Um, through specialist teachers, for example? Um, um, it doesn't need to be uh, specialist te teachers, but yeah. if, in, I mean, does, do you think the local authorities should provide outdoor um, residential education for all of their children? Um, and it would be up to them to, to decide. One of, one of the uh, practical ways of, of doing that, if there isn't the expertise within a school, amongst the school staff, um, to act on sort of leadership, but also the other person who's important is the instructor at the outdoor centre. Um, nowadays, an instructor um, has to be pretty good and wide, much wider range of skills than they used to be. I mean, it used to be that someone was a sail training instructor or a kayaker or ca canoe expert, but now they also have to understand the links to the curriculum. So, I mean, there, there are issues there around the instructors at the centre as well as the teachers in the schools. Um, but I think, um, you know, just as we have specialist music teachers who are peripatetic, specialist PE teachers who are peripatetic, it might be that there is a, a sort of teacher who is trained now as a specialist in outdoor learning and might go away with a school, um, one school at one time and another school at another time. But certainly um, personnel involved in this is an issue that's going to have to be sorted out. Okay. Well, one model that, uh, that I've seen that worked very well was from a, a London uh, local authority where the centre staff were actually based in London, even though the centre was in North Wales. So the centre staff would actually work with the schools in the schools and then go away with the teachers and the children to the centre uh, so that there was much more continuity uh, built in that way. I, I think other barriers that are worth ad identifying are the need for senior leadership buy-in from the school. Uh, when it's just an enthusiastic teacher as it was when I was a teacher, my head was very clear. When you go, the next person in might be a chess champion. It won't necessarily be an outdoor person. So um, it uh, that is, is, I think, essential senior leadership buy-in. Uh, I think the problems increase as you go higher up the age groups as well into maybe S3 and above, uh, partly because in secondary schools you have very large uh, cohorts and having centres that can take, let's say, half a year group or a whole year group uh, becomes um, quite important in terms of how you manage that displacement in the school of a, of a, of a big group of students and teachers. And also then the priorities, when the, you get to the point where people are uh, focused on uh, studying for their examinations. And, and there's a lot of evidence to say that residentials really support uh, the young people who are studying for examinations, but there isn't the confidence often in the teaching staff to take what they perceive as a risk of taking time out of the classroom. Uh, to, uh, to take young people away, except where that's mandated by, for example, geography or biology field trips in some places. Anya. Thank you. Uh, I think um, the question is, is a great one, the question of entitlement. Uh, in Scotland, uh, it seems to me already that we're very far along the journey of making it an entitlement that young people have the opportunity to learn about sustainability. Learning for sustainability is three things. It's education for global citizenship, education for sustainable development, and outdoor learning. Those three entitlements are already there. If the bill does not refer to those policy moves that are already in place, it seems a bit remiss to my mind. And connecting the bill to those existing entitlements and adding in a view that outdoor learning is, is an entitlement. And within that entitlement, outdoor residential provision of education in an outdoor setting would be, would be important. And that while on residential setting visits, learning for sustainability would be a requirement. It would seem to be an obvious next step uh, within this bill, either in its guidance or preferably in its main statement. So what steps should the Scottish Government take to address all of these barriers? I would refer you to a model uh, of how uh, this was brought about in another country. I would refer you to Singapore which 10 years ago decided to introduce a progressive series of residentials, three in a child's career, uh, as well as outdoor learning within the schools for all young people in all schools in Singapore, one of the most urban 
uh, pieces of landscape uh, that you can imagine. They've just rolled out the third level of residential, so they're now uh, dealing with the third, third tier of that programme. And what they put in place in terms of uh, the, the Ministry of, of Education in Singapore, in terms of uh, providing the infrastructure necessary uh, for those uh, different types of residentials for different age groups to go ahead, what they put in place in terms of staff development for the schools uh, in, in, in order that they could provide the in-school as well as the residential provision and the, and the career path that they created for people to work in outdoor centres as, a, as a, uh, an acceptable serious career choice rather than something you do for five years before you get a proper job kind of the, uh, thing. So, so that, uh, and there's a lot more behind that model, uh, I would recommend it to you and it, it's um, well uh, easily available to uh, uh, to access how they went about that. And, and I think there'll be there'll be several more models, Chris, around the world. You know, a lot of been there are a lot of successful countries in terms of taking children on outdoor residentials. And Scandinavian countries are very good at it. Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I mean they've probably all got their models of how to handle this in terms of resource. Mm -hmm. I was to just summarise uh, some of the points I've already made would be uh, what, what, what government needs to do would be to take account of young people's views, given we have incorporated the UNCRC into law. Uh, this bill needs to be reflective of what the Children's Parliament have done in this area. Um, that would be one thing. The other thing would be to in make sure that we have flexibility in terms of inclusion in the bill so that it, it is there for the broad reach and, and taking a systemic and broader scope would ideally uh, position the residential experience in terms of outdoor within a wider framing, which has to be around outdoor learning and within that um, context, learning for sustainability in the context of the nature emergency. I think looking back to the tradition of Curtan and the long standing research that we know um, is there that tells us about self-confidence and leadership, where in a way those models of residential outdoor provision uh, drew upon an idea that maybe the more privileged people in society in Gordonstoun and other schools such like uh, needed a certain kind of leadership experience and uh, there was also a time when we needed young men to enter the battlefield uh, and, and outdoor provision in scouting movements for example was part of the solution there. Looking back to those pasts I think is, is also narrow uh, in, in scope and we need to look forward to what we might want young people to learn about in, in the context of the nature emergency just now. Okay, thank you, Jackie. We move to George Adam. Thank you, convener. Good morning again, uh, everyone. Uh, everyone's spoken about their kind of individual things that happened. I remember going to scout camps in Ardentini, I think it was, and my day uh, with school. It was a right of passage almost uh, for us. But I don't remember any life-changing experience uh, myself, but I was a pretty stroppy and cynical teen, so thank goodness I've grown up and matured a bit <laughs> since then. I knew I'd get that response, that's why I said it. Uh, but uh, Mr Mannion, uh, Professor Mannion, sorry, uh, I would like to ask, uh, you've already mentioned this, so what position does residential outdoor education have within approaches to outdoor learning? And the other part of that would be, and how does that include learning for sustainability as well? You've already outlined some of that, but if you can maybe go into a wee bit more detail, that'd be quite interesting for us. Okay, I think there are some residential centres that uh, are doing more in this area. I think they, the, the, the sell online in the web maybe isn't as reflective of some of the practice. But if you look at the websites for these centres, you will see that they are taking definitions of outdoor education as their main definition rather than outdoor learning. Uh, they're not uh, necessarily offering provision that reflects the broad curriculum areas of maths and music and drama and history because they, they take the traditional residential centre view that it might be more about kayaking and, and skills in outdoor pursuits. Uh, and the result of that is that the outcomes that the centres are, are offering are accruing around uh, self-confidence and leadership. If the bill was to, to, to ask for these centres to address uh, conservation activity or pro-environmental behaviour or learning for sustainability more, or in all learning uh, in, in residential settings, then that would be achieved quite easily. We have the staff, we have people who know what that means and we know how that would work. Uh, there are many ways of engaging young people in conservation actions around, you know, for example, taking away invasive species, uh, around uh, rewilding, understanding the context around the potential for 
the reintroduction, for example, of beavers and what impact that has. These are all environmental issues that are to do with our relationship with the environment. And given the urban centres of Scotland are so heavily populated and how many of those young people live in areas of deprivation and how many of those young people have never, ever been to a, a national park or into an area of natural beauty in Scotland. To bring them to those contexts is ec an excellent thing to do. To bring them to those contexts and to help them understand their national identity at a time of environmental change would seem to be a, an absolutely brilliant thing to do. To do that in the context of supporting teachers to offer wider arrays of outdoor learning would be an absolutely brilliant thing to do as well. I hope that gives you a sense of what might be possible here. But if you do not, uh, if you continue to use the word outdoor education in your bill, and if you do not raise the issue of environmental concerns in the bill, you will end up with more of the same, is my gut feeling. The other thing is, Professor Manu, is the engagement of young people. Many of the issues you've mentioned are issues that we know that young people are extremely interested in. So for wanting them to engage with education and to move forward, these are the issues that they'd want to do. Things have moved on from uh, jumping down a zip wire and uh, canoeing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Children's Parliament are absolutely brilliant in this area. They have done consultations and uh, engagement using creative methods with very young children. What young children uh, from primary age right through to secondary want is more outdoor learning. They want it in all shapes and forms, including residential. And within that outdoor provision, the young people's voices across the UK, in fact, uh, with other research coming through from young activists, is that they want, young, they want the context of outdoor learning provision to address questions of sustainability. They understand that they are, that they are living in a contracted way with another older generation who are not addressing these environmental concerns. They want to understand them better so that they can get the green skills to get, I mean, there's another whole area we didn't talk about today. The whole question of the economy and, and, and skilling people up for a green economy as we shift towards uh, zero carbon. These are absolutely core goals for every government in the world. To bring people, young people outdoors to natural settings and not to see the possible links between green skills and learning for sustainability just now would seem to be uh, just a, a, missed, a missed opportunity. Dr. Stratton, if it's... Um, I think one, one thing that has been raised recently um, uh, in, in the context of, of the residential form of education is interdisciplinary learning. Um, it, it, uh, um, there's a colleague of mine called Pete Higgins, some of you might know him. <laughs> um, he uh, is now advocating, um, partly within the context of learning for sustainability, but also more broadly, um, the potential of residential um, study to introduce interdis interdisciplinary learning um, and not, not just about um, that involves or links up different disciplines but also uh, what we call pedagogies the way in which students learn and or teachers teach and students learn um, there are opportunities within the residential to pursue these um, the, other, uh, the other thing I'll come back to is um, this issue of the instructors convener, which um, is quite a big issue, actually. Um, y you know, we're still instructing instructors or teaching instructors um, on the more physical skills, um, paddling down rivers and climbing crags and things like that, when really the instructors on site and the sort of thing that Chris was talking about, the instructors coming into the school, these have actually got to be, to a certain extent, trained teachers themselves now in order to make sure that the learning elements that relate to the curriculum come out of the residential. Um, but there is a drift. There is a drift away from these what we call hard skills to the softer skills and the learning skills in what is covered in, in residentials. Uh, I'd like to... Um come back to that point about sustainability because I think um, we, your sustainability involves social as well as environmental equity um, and I think there is some value in some of our history uh, in that broadening horizons as, as Roger's just been talking about and, uh, and, and Greg uh, are taking people out of where they normally live often in quite a small geographical area of their experience and showing them something else it is an extraordinary thing to be able to do for a young person in their development. Uh, COVID, for example, brought huge numbers of, young, of people to the Lake District National Park uh, that previously had never visited. 
And as one indicator of that, the ethnic diversity of visitors to the National Park pre and post COVID has gone from 3% to 23%. Um, so uh, exposure, uh, familiarity, uh, the excitement of coming over, this is part of the place that I live in, the country that I belong to, I think is really important, that broadening horizons agenda. I think the other agenda that uh, a study I'm in the middle of is, is comparing um, Singapore, Finland, um, Australia, Canada, uh, and as it happens, Scotland, um, uh, for the question, what does outdoor education do for society? I'm using the term outdoor education here, Greg, in a broader sense, I would encompass outdoor learning. Um, and what does it do for society and the three trends that, that are coming through, both in terms of aspiration, but increasingly in terms of evidence of what's actually happening in those communities, uh, is broadening horizons, as I've mentioned. Social integration, which I think is going rapidly up the agenda at the moment uh, in, in the UK and, and, and all parts of, of the United Kingdom, I would imagine, are concerned about social integration. Uh, because of the, uh, the way in which residential experiences give that opportunity to bring everybody together around one shared big experience. And, and the third is adaptation. Greg's mentioned the needs for uh, us to address sustainability. Uh, and I think one of the things that we are facing, uh, our young people in particular are facing, is change in all sorts, whether it's AI or climate change or biodiversity loss, uh, economic shifts uh, to green economies, all of these things involve significant changes. And outdoor residentials, those traditional outputs of resilience, adaptability, creativity, collaboration, all of those skills that residentials deliver means you've got a fantastic tool to help people to adapt to what's coming next. Thank you. We now move to Miles Briggs. Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, and it's a good lead what you've just said, Professor, uh, lines into what I wanted to ask with regards to measuring these outcomes. Um, because we know and acutely aware as a committee the poor levels of mental health which are being reported um, amongst young people of all uh, backgrounds. And so considering this opportunity around outcomes um, of residential outdoor education, the building of resilience in our young people I think is a key measurement which we would like to see and so from your experience um, what would you like to see um, measured as part of the outcomes of this and um, you touched upon uh, Dr um, Scott in some of the work you had done in research from your 2012 paper um, about outdoor education being beneficial to pupils from lower social groups um, so just wondered in that context how we would be able to measure these outcomes to really demonstrate the value which can be added. Mm. Uh, I'm a qualitative researcher, so I will broaden the idea of measurement and, and, and turn to my colleagues who have more experience in quantitative measures. But resilience is measurable, in is, is researchable in both, both ways. My experience as a qualitative researcher following the stories of, for example, family interventions. And, and one of our biggest impacts in the Learning Away project was where we work with families rather than classes. Uh, where, where families, where the young, young people in that family were beginning to truant, were, were dropping out of school, dropping out of paying attention in school, misbehaving, bullying, those kinds of, 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 of indicators of things not, being, not going well. And uh, a short series of, of residentials with the family to, to look at how that um, uh, family is parenting and how the children are experiencing life at home and the relationship with the home to the school was very was was transformative uh, and the parents were so impressed with it they then recruited other families to come on the program on our behalf um, so i i think it, it targeting in, in 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 those more extreme circumstances works very well so the potential for specialist provision for those sort of targeted needs it might be something you'd like to consider uh, but in general, well-being is a, a broad, broad spectrum issue uh, that we know we can address and do address. I'm not sure of its long-term uh, impacts. I know it has short-term benefits. Perhaps uh, my colleagues can add to that. Professor um, so are, are you Are you interested in the methodologies that we uh, use? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as Chris has said, uh, 
he specialises in um, what we call qualitative methodologies. That's talking to people, interviewing, getting written reports, perhaps, um, observing, observation. And um, what we try to do with the qualitative data is, is something called triangulation. So if you get to three sources of information, you can triangulate them. You know, some might come from the teacher, some might come from the pupils themselves, some might come from your own observations, and you arrive at an outcome um, and which might be a, a personal development or it might be a, a more sort of on development at the cognitive end of the scale, the learning scale. Um, quantitatively, which is where I specialise, um, we use, by and large, pretty standard um, uh, psychological methodologies for um, assessing the value of a psychological intervention. Um, so it's, it's really... Um, experimental and quasi-experiment. I don't know if you know what that means in specifically, but basically we um, make, uh, measure um, pupils in whatever um, skill or ability or attribute you, you're interested in before they go away, usually quite a bit before they go away, so they're not emotionally tied up with the, the actual event. Um, then they go away and we measure them again when you get back and there are oh, hundreds and hundreds of um, what we call instruments to do this in different aspects of um, psychological impact and academic impact and so on and so forth. And then, um, and you do it with a control group, which is what you would normally do um, with um, a psychology or a medical intervention. Um, but then um, we would measure also the impact, that's the outcome. We'd measure the impact maybe six months later. Sometimes it's uh, an ongoing study when you do the same sort of thing, uh, repeat the measurement several times. Um, sometimes you will follow a cohort, the same cohort of pupils over year one, year two, year three, and so on, and see how they've changed. But you always ask them the same questions. That's very important. Um, Chris knows I was a bit of a critic of the learning away quantitative work because they didn't ask the same questions before and after the interventions and that distorts the answers. You must answer, ask the same questions before and after. Same in psychology, same in education. And while I'm babbling on, just quickly, um, I pulled together a few years ago um, all the measures of benefit on uh, using a measure called effect size. Effect size is something that you can use to normalise measures from all sorts of um, sources. So I did that for outdoor education, obviously, residential outdoor education, but I did it for all education and all psychology. And what you find when you do that is the benefits, the quantitatively measured benefit in outdoor education is more or less the same, if not slightly more, than the measure you get from psychology and all, whole hundreds of psychology interventions and educational interventions. So in a nutshell, that's, that's how we go about it. Um, thank you. Uh, one of the points made there was that young people face mental, challenge, mental health challenges and their well-being is connected to their mental well-being. Uh, and that is also connected these days to what is termed in the literature now eco-anxiety. This is concern for the environment. Um, and one of the things we, we know about uh, the solutions to broad well-being mental well-being in general is contact with nature. So not every residential is, is offering that, but most probably do. But that's a key aspect of the, the well-being agenda and well-being is one of the key cornerstones of learning for, of uh, curriculum for excellence. The other thing people do when they address, uh, and, and we know this works, is they get an opportunity to talk. So if, if talk and, and talk about issues that are personal and talk about eco-anxiety issues as part of residential set settings, that would also improve that area. But, and the other aspect is action, taking action, pro-agency pro, pro, pro approaches where young people are involved in, in doing something for the environment is known to ameliorate their eco-anxiety. Uh, connection to place, so revisiting the same place more than once and doing that over time possibly in a local area with their teacher, and then thinking about those local issues in a broader context on a residential setting would, in my view, be a, a great way to address, in a place-responsive way, their eco-anxieties and their broader uh, well-being around mental well-being. 
but also their physical well-being. Studies of physical well-being around physical activity levels are known to go up, of course, when you leave the building and stop sitting down. Uh, so that's not an, that's not that's a no-brainer in many ways. But if you if you think about the obesity crisis you're facing as a government, uh, doing more outdoor learning of any kind regularly would be an ideal way to begin to address that, not just through physical education uh, parameters. Thank you. Um, we're just running a bit short of time, so uh, if, if we're okay, uh, are you finished, Miles? Yep. Okay. Uh, Ross Greer. Thanks, convener. Good morning, all. Um, I'd just like to go back to, you've touched on this a couple of times, um, but I'd like to, to focus in on it. Professor Mannion, you mentioned uh, some evidence showing that about 80% of the outdoor education that young people in Scotland currently get is uh, not residential. I think you talked about the average is out half an hour a week um, in, in total. I'm interested in your thoughts on the, the value of uh, residential, outdoor residential education specifically, as opposed to outdoor education more generally, because there's been um, suggestions uh, made as, as this bill was initially proposed and in the consultation process that a wider entitlement to outdoor education would be more appropriate rather than a specific entitlement to residential education. But obviously, the bill proposes residential education specifically. Um, I don't think anyone, certainly um, around this table, would dispute the value of residential education. You've all given a very compelling case for it. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on this argument about whether we should be creating that very specific entitlement or taking a, a wider approach of entitling young people to outdoor education in the round. If we could start with Professor Mannion on that. Thank you. Um, I would use the word outdoor learning and within, within that rather than taking the approach of um, umbrellaing everything under outdoor education, which is a certain term in the policy term, in the policy movement over decades now in Scotland, we use this word outdoor learning. Some of that can be residential provision or we could take the term education in the outdoors. Uh, that would be one uh, t t terminology shift. But I would, uh, I would, I would do both and. Uh, to, to answer your question, it's a, it's a simple win. Make it an entitlement in the curriculum that everybody gets outdoor education and outdoor settings. Within that, make it a further entitlement that people get a, a residential experience. It's not a big ask. If you were to take away physical education from the curriculum right now, I don't think you'd have anybody voting for that. Uh, if you want to increase physical education time, everybody would warrant that's a great idea. Why not do that? at the same time increasing physical activity levels by encouraging outdoor learning in the Scottish context. Uh, we have the context for it, we have the services for it, we have the countryside and the landscape for it, uh, and we need to do it because of environmental issues. So I think a nomenclature change around outdoor learning, making that the entitlement, continuing with the bill and making it an entitlement around uh, uh, the residential settings being uh, important and worthy and therefore fundable or needing funding seems like a great idea uh, that would be if I was a policymaker in that direction if that was possible I'm not in your hot seat I'm just here to do the easy thing which is uh, give you tell you what we know from the, the, the research that we do. Thanks I, I think it was yourself Professor Mannion who did acknowledge earlier on that um, this is expensive um, that you know the, 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 the benefit to the children and young people in, involved is absolutely indisputable but it is, it's resource intensive is there a particular value for money argument for residential learning opportunities as opposed to that wider approach of um, entitlement to, to outdoor learning. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the, the argument specifically for residential uh, learning as, as particularly valuable. The literature is clear about what residentials offer. You've heard about that today. Inputs and outputs. If you continue down the path of offering the same old residential experiences, we get the same guaranteed outcomes around resilience, self-confidence, leadership, and so on. If you want it to be more curricular linked, you need professional learning for teachers, uh, as well as better instructor education. Uh, if you want a systemic better offer all round, and we know that outdoor learning is effective on a, on a half hour basis, uh, taking children of any age into the school grounds or into their local areas. We also know that people learn uh, to take a place responsive approach if they make regular visits to a local area, which is impossible if you only offer a one week, five day experience. Um, so remember, even the good schools that were offering residential, it was only one fifth of the provision 
and we know that the other four fifths could double. So if you wanted to, if you in, in fact, if you continue uh, to offer residential experiences, but you promote professional learning, you could double outdoor learning provision, and that would be a different bang for your buck, to use that very awful phrase. But you've asked the, the, the money question, and again, I'm not in your hot seat. Thanks very much. I think once to come in. Okay, when I ask myself that question, which you posed again just now, I, I think about um, all those people who say it was one of the best experiences of my life, and they say it until they're about 50, 60, 70 years old. I mean, I can remember going to Plassey Brennan in North Wales um, before residential outdoor education was really off the ground. Um, and so it is a unique experience, and it's a unique experience that lasts people a lifetime. That's how I answer it for myself. Um, it influences careers, um, it influences personal beliefs, it influences connectedness to nature, and so on and so forth. Um, if you were to ask someone, do you remember going out into the school playground and using a hand lens to look at a bit of grass, which can be a very valuable form of outdoor learning, they won't be able to remember it. So, you know, I do ask myself that question that you pose quite often. Um, but I think um, it's the long-term impact that is really different about residential stuff. As somebody who vividly remembers my own residential experience, I completely appreciate that, although this morning <laughs> has brought me to the distressing conclusion that that was now almost 20 years ago. <laughs> Can I add a little to that in that I'm trying to remember the name of the authors and the organisations involved, and I can't. But they, there is a, a, a British quango that was set up to, I think, particularly look at what interventions make the biggest difference, uh, cost-benefit analysis in a school to attainment. And uh, outdoor residential, outdoor learning in general, and outdoor residentials in particular, were in the top five of those interventions. Uh, and that was international data, based on international data, including UK data. Um, our own data from Learning Away asks that question, what's the difference of staying away overnight uh, instead of just going away for a day? Um, and uh, what we found was that the unstructured time that is inevitably built into being away overnight, the time around the campfire, the time cooking a meal or eating a meal together, the time playing games after that meal, the time in the tent or the dormitory together without adults present, uh, all of that time is when the learning gets deepened. Uh, it, the stories are told. Uh, you see uh, people behaving in less, in more, less formal, informal ways. Teachers call each other by their first names. Things like that become significant to the changes in relationships that take place. And there is something, and neuroscience is increasingly supporting this claim, uh, there's something about the diurnal cycle what happens in the brain because you wake up the next morning and you're still there and you've got another day to follow on from what you did the day before, that iterative process of, oh, here we go again. I've got more confidence today. I'm going to try some new things. I've made a new friend. I can build on that. So that process, I think, is um, particularly of value. Thanks, Arch. I'd just like to add, in terms of your cost-benefit analysis, a lot of the Learning Away schools who struggled with the, the, with the finances of it went to a low-cost camping model, particularly the primary schools. And the low-cost camping model wasn't just a financial choice, it was better pedagogically, uh, because the teachers felt in control and because just having camps, preparing a meal, putting up your tents, working out what, how to live, live together is your curriculum. Uh, it's, you don't have much left of the day after you've done all of those things. And, and so it was a very effective uh, and a integrated approach. All really useful, thank you. Next convener. Okay, thank you. We move to John Mason. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, continuing on that <coughs> theme, uh, you've convinced me that residential is a good idea. So can you convince me that it's got to be at a, a residential outdoor? Uh, because um, that is a very specific thing. I'd also like to ask about the ages that, that, that kids do things if we've got time. But, I mean, for example, it's been suggested that young people going to Kew, Kew Gardens might be valuable, <coughs> uh, but that might not count as residential outdoor education. Uh, Ms Smith and I have a friend who takes groups to the First World War battlefields. Um, when I, at the end of my first year, just to uh, S1, 
uh, we went on a tour of the Highlands. I don't remember what we did, but I remember being at these different places. And, I mean, I've got a whole chunk of friends in Glasgow who have never even been to Inverness, let alone a, a, a park. So, if we've got £30 million to play with um, every year, uh, should we widen it out a bit, or has it got to be residential outdoor education? I see Prof uh, Professor Mannion, you're nodding your head. Yeah, if I may, just briefly, I'll keep it short. I, absolutely, this flexibility is key. Uh, and, and, and so the indoor-outdoor bit is important. We need to be thinking flexibly about what's an outdoor and what's an indoor experience. Uh, but some experiences in nature and in really high-quality nature uh, um, sites of scientific interest, these are going to be very special occasions for young people. But so will a visit to a war, uh, a war site. Uh, or a battleground, and, and these are out, these are absolutely in my literature. The literature I read about outdoor education, called outdoor learning in our in our country and in my other countries, that shift towards outdoor learning is to see it as an interdisciplinary context. It could be music, it could be drama, it could be a walk on the dro local drove road. Uh, if we're flexibly offering provision uh, in in terms of funding, either for residential or the broader systemic support, I would be doing both. Uh, if I was government, uh, this money could be viably spent to support both professional learning of educators and the, the development of residential centre provision so that it's connected to learning for sustainability and done in a way that allows for an inclusive provision whether teachers want to bring the tents to the local park overnight for nine-year-olds. If you're not flexibly offering those pathways to teachers and education centres at the same time, I think you will miss out on the benefits that are possible for the kind of money you're talk talking about spending. And while you're, speak, while you're answering um, on the age issue, are, are you convinced about the P6 to S4, or no, would you want no, flexibility no. in that as well? Absolutely, absolutely. As I've described in my, in my uh, statement, I, I, I know schools that begin their resident, residential experiences with uh, five- and six-year-olds, and the early years settings even younger go with their parents. Uh, at five and six, they begin to go away for one night, and they move over the career of their primary age until age 13, they do about 25 or 28 nights in total. Um, so schools are, are clear about what's, what's possible if they have funding and if they have the courage and uh, commitment from their teachers and from their leadership that this is a good thing to do and we should be learning from, from them. Uh, so it doesn't have to be only about transition and it doesn't have to be that you're 12 years of age before you go on residential. That seems like a um, as, a, as a Boy Scout myself, I started at age eight, uh, going away. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, uh, Professor Lawrence. I was going to come to you next. Um, too specific, is it, or are no, you happy I, with the I, bill? I, what, one example I would give to add to what Greg, Greg has said is I work with the schools from the small isles and nearby. And uh, one of the things that, that they need to be able to do, because often there's only eight or ten pupils in the school, is to go away together. And that's a full age range from P1 to P6. Uh, so going away together for them means uh, taking younger people as well as older people. And that, Can I just ask you, would it not benefit them to come to Glasgow rather than going an outdoor centre? Ab absolutely. And, and the things they wanted to do, there were three things. One was to go to a fesh so that they could play their instruments in an orchestra. The second was to have a game of football with the right number of people in the team. And the third was to come to Glasgow. Uh, yeah, so uh, going away doesn't have to be an outdoor, uh, uh, classical outdoor experience. Going to an urban centre, we had a lovely model of school exchanges between a Cornish school on a surf beach and a school in very urban Birmingham. And they swapped and they camped in each other's school grounds, and they had homestay. And the kids from Cornwall went to a mosque and a football match, and the kids from Birmingham went to the beach and, and rode a pony and things of that kind. And that, that was um, uh, extremely effective. So there are lots of different models. The flexibility is important. We had uh, uh, year, year two uh, uh, students. They would camp in cardboard boxes in the school grounds. And uh, their parents would come and collect them at 10 o'clock at night after they'd gone to sleep in the box in the school grounds. Um, and uh, they talked forever about how they had the night of two sleeps. Uh, so it, it, it's quite possible to start young. In fact, there, the parents are the ones that needed your reassurance about the, the experience rather than the, uh, the young people. People would need reassurance about the cardboard boxes. But, um, Dr. Scruton? Well, um, just very, very briefly, it's the residential bit, I think, that is crucial. 
um, that will have a, a, a knock-on effect to, um, onto attitudes towards learning, um, how you get on with other people, um, confidence in yourself. I mean, whether it's uh, um, and it's interesting, Chris, because I've spoken to someone recently from the Outer Isles who said they desperately want to come to Glasgow. Um, that is what they want to do because they have plenty of the outdoor stuff in the Outer Isles and they want something different. But, um, yeah, no, I think the, the crucial thing is the residential because that changes people's um, feelings, characteristics and personalities and all that sort of thing. And then all the knock-on effects yep. through to learning and academic learning and attainment and so on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. John, did you, because we don't have any more questions, do you want to ask about the ages or? Uh, oh yes, I didn't really pursue it. Well, um, Professor Mannion gave me an answer about ages. Did, did you feel we should be more flexible on the ages as well? I, I, I think it helps. Because schools can then be creative about meeting <coughs> what they perceive as their opportunities and needs. Um, I, I think if you've got limited resources, then P6 is a, is, and upwards is a good target because that transition from primary to secondary is so crucial and um, is a great place to offer support through the residential process. But uh, if there's opportunities for schools to be creative with the budget that they receive, then they could provide progressive experiences over a number of years, and I think that would be very constructive. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you are our first panel of witnesses for our Stage 1 deliberations on this bill, so it's been very helpful uh, to kick that off today. Uh, grateful for your time, uh, the submissions you put into the committee, and for your answers you've given us today. A lot to think about uh, and to take forward as well. So thank you very much. And at that point, uh, I will suspend the meeting and we'll move into a private session. Thank you.